Howdy folks, I'm Hank Sheffer, and welcome to another true life story right here with Larry Hedrick on Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. During the war between the states, there were something like 6,000 engagements fought by a mere handful of men to tens of thousands of soldiers. None of those battles has been any more controversial than the Battle of Picacho Pass, the westernmost battle of the Civil War out here in Arizona. The who, what, when, where, and why was all up for grabs. Everything you're gonna see in this presentation is actual fact. It's not a Hollywood based on something else. Everything is exactly the way the battle reports from both commanders in this book tell a story. You can look below here and see where you can obtain this book if you'd like to have it. Our story starts just slightly before the Civil War with a newly promoted major by the name of Henry Hopkins Sibley, who was now in charge of Fort Union. He was the commander of Fort Union, which was the last outpost before you entered Colorado through Raton Pass. Sibley was in a perfect position to know the disposition of all the troops in uh, Arizona and New Mexico. A lot of the troops had been pulled back east when the war broke out, and he was well aware of that. So he resigned his commission and went straight to Richmond to talk to Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, with his plan. The three-part plan that Sibley presented to Jefferson Davis was to extend the land mass of the Confederacy to the Pacific Ocean and uh, hoping to influence the European nations to recognize her drive for independence. The second part of the plan was to reach and recruit a lot of Southern sympathizers that were known to be in Southern, in Southern California. And the third part of the plan, and most important, was to bring the mineral resources and wealth of the West into the Confederate influence. Sibley was made a Brigadier General and joined the Confederate Army by Davis and was sent to Texas to link up with uh, Colonel Baylor, who already had an army, and to build a larger army to invade New Mexico. In February of 1862, the plan to invade New Mexico was put into action. Colonel Baylor uh, divided Arizona and New Mexico with a line on a 32nd parallel east to west and called the southern half Arizona and the northern half was New Mexico. Captain Hunter was uh, sent to Tucson to occupy Tucson and uh, take over the uh, mineral operations that were around Tucson and he left uh, in February with a 54-man force. Captain Hunter immediately set about to make his small force, which never was more than a hundred soldiers in Tucson, to look as formidable as possible. To this, the California authorities believed that there was as many as uh, seven to eight hundred Confederates in Tucson. So they raised a 2,300-man volunteer force in California and started on their way to, uh, to Arizona. In the meantime, uh, Captain Hunter learned about Emil White, who had a mill up at the Sacatone Villages, and he and was holding supplies for the Union. So he went up and arrested Mr. White and gave all his stores to the Pima Indians. Uh, at this point in time, uh, uh, Captain McCleave came over with a, a nine-man Union force to pick up these supplies. Good afternoon, sir. Captain McLeave, Federal Forces. Yes, sir. Look for Mr. Jones. We have to order and purchase some foodstuffs and grain here. And I'm Captain Hunter of Confederate Forces. I'm calling you for your surrender. Take it, boys. And Hunter, posing as Mr. White in civilian clothing, captured all of his men without firing a shot. McLeave was so disgusted with the tactics of Hunter to wearing civilian clothing that he challenged Hunter's men to a fist fight, his men against Hunter's twice uh, number. And if he won, he was to be set free. Well, of course, uh, Captain Hunter declined, and Emil White and uh, Captain McCleave were sent back to Mesilla, New Mexico, under the command of Jack Swilling. 
Now, Jack Swilling was credited sometimes with being the leader of the Battle of Picacho Pass, but he was not there. He was in Mesilla, New Mexico, when the battle took place. Um, Captain Hunter, going back to Tucson, left a force of 10 men, a sergeant and nine privates at Picacho Pass. Their entire uh, duty was to inform Tucson of any movement by the Union on Tucson. Uh, Captain Callaway, who was in charge of the Union forces up at uh, the Pima villages, uh, ordered uh, Lieutenant Barrett, James Barrett, 12 men and a scout by the name of Jones, to circle around Picacho Pass and come in from the Tucson side to cut off the, any escape route of the enemy that they knew was there. And they were, Barrett was to wait for the reinforcements from Captain Callaway before he took any action. Lieutenant Barrett, though, was anxious for a fight, particularly since Captain Callaway's men had been captured, and he located the base camp of the Confederates where Sergeant Holmes and two privates were uh, situated, and he attacked them. And he managed to capture them without any casualties. And, uh, but the other seven Confederates rode to the sound of the guns and took a dismounted position in a heavy thicket. Despite the pleas by Mr. Jones for Cat Lieutenant Barrett to dismount, Lieutenant Barrett attacked the Confederates single file mounted. The first fire from the enemy, according to the battle reports, emptied four saddles. And uh, I'd like to state that uh, I don't think that that meant that there were four casualties because, you see, Hunter's forces uh, were Indian fighters and their horses were used to being fired from. Fire! Uh, Colonel Carl Carlton, who was in command of the 2300 force, had told his men that, that if it becomes necessary to engage the enemy, use the saber rather than the pistols, because it takes all the men to control their California horses. They were all volunteers. They had not been in combat, and their horses had not been in combat. And I can tell you about rodeos that happen when that goes on. Anyway, uh, Barrett evidently took Jones's advice because after the initial fire from the enemies, they fell back in disorder and dismounted. Had four of those men been casualties right off the bat, leaving a couple of men to, to hold the horses and guard the prisoners, he wouldn't have had enough men to effectively follow up on the Confederates. But while, on, while f attacking the Federates, Confederates on foot, Barrett was mortally wounded and two other of his men were killed. And after 90 minutes, an hour and a half of desperate fighting, leaderless, running out of ammunition, the Union soldiers took their three Confederate captives and retreated uh, off the field. Four hours later, Captain Calloway came with a 272-man force and found that the battle was over. Now, in his report, Captain Calloway opened his report to Carlton by saying, Sir, I have the honor to inform you. And when you lead something like that, you would think, hey, I won that battle. It was the last sentence that told the whole story. He says, after this unfortunate affair, I retreated to the Pima villages. Calloway had lost all chance of surprise on Tucson, because the Confederates are gone, and uh, Captain uh, Hunter sent Lieutenant Tevis back up the next day to see what happened to his three missing men, and he got there in time to see Callaway with 272 men and 10 wagons retreating back to the Pima villages. They still believe, the Union still believe there was as many as seven or 800 Confederates in Tucson, but uh, the, the, it delayed them advancing on Tucson for a while. But by that time, C Captain Hunter had learned of the reverses of Sibley in New Mexico. Uh, Sibley had taken every fort all the way up the Rio Grande. He took Albuquerque, he took Santa Fe.
And on his way to take Fort Union, he, the Colorado volunteers had come down, and at Glorietta Pass, they met. Sibley was driving the Union at the end of the day, apparently going to have another victory. But a, a cavalry officer uh, went around the whole battle and found the 64 inadequately prepared uh, protected wagons of the Confederacy and destroyed them all. Now, without any supplies, uh, Sibley was forced to retreat to New Mexico. So when, when Captain Hunter learned of this, he decided it was time to go. <laughs> His first night out, he got to Dragoon Springs, just east of Benson, and he was attacked by Apaches. He lost four men, 25 horses, and 30 mules. But he made it back to the Mesilla. There were three Union soldiers killed at the Battle of Picacho Pass in 1862, Lieutenant Barrett, uh, Privates Johnson, and Privates Leonard. That, according to the battle reports found in this book, which is the only place the battle reports on both sides were ever published, um, they were buried where they fell. In 1892, uh, soldiers from Fort Lowell were sent up uh, gather the bodies of the of the boys that had died there. They were buried on the spot, and they dug up two of them, and they were reinterred in the Presidio in San Francisco. But they didn't find Lieutenant Barrett. In the 1920s, uh, an employee of the Southern Pacific Railroad making trips from Tucson to Phoenix noticed the crosses that were at the site of the, the battle and that they had fallen over and the place was not being taken care of. So he got together with some other employees at Southern Pacific and they fashioned a, a monument plaque uh, to commemorate these people. And in 1928, the Arizona Pioneers Historical Society and the Union Pacific Railroad and about 200 people, including the governor of Arizona at the time, all met there to uh, raise this monument. So when they were digging the base for the monument to be set in 1928, they come upon a blanket with human remains in it. And the Historical Society took a couple of buttons and a few pieces of the blanket for display, and Lieutenant Barrett lies buried to this day in the very spot in which he fell. This is the original stone monument that was erected by the Southern Pacific Railroad and the Arizona Historical Pioneers Historical Society in 1928. And it was down by the railroad tracks in the pass. It wasn't up here at the state park. It was there to commemorate the fallen Union soldiers, the Battle of Picacho Pass. When the park opened in 1968, the monument was moved to the site you see now. Many years ago, I was in the Superstition Mountains with Tom Collinborn and a film crew from Channel 10. Uh, on the way out, which is about a two-hour ride, I was talking to the producer of Channel 10, and I was telling him about the Battle of Picacho Pass. And he said uh, that, um, you know, I had a cavalry unit. I had all the military saddles. I had the men and recruited. We had all the uniforms and stuff like that. And uh, he said that if his sponsor would go for it, we'd do a documentary on, on the battle. Well, about two weeks later, he sent me a letter, but then that's when I decided that I better not open a can of worms unless I know what it's talking about. So I wrote this booklet, and I went down to Arizona State University to talk to uh, Bert Fireman, which was uh, a historian down there, and he thought that there was some battle reports in the library. And sure enough, I dug them up, and I printed them in this book. And uh, the Arizona Dairy Association decided to sponsor it, and they sent Bill Leverton of Arizona Roads down to do the, the uh, reenactment. And uh, I had everything laid out. Bill didn't have to do a thing. He just filmed what we, what we laid out. And um, <laughs> it seemed to me Bill wasn't very excited about doing this thing. But by the time it was over, he was very happy with it. And this thing was showed on Channel 10 I don't know how many times. And he gave me a nice three-quarter inch uh, video of the thing that, uh, that I can't play because I don't have a three-quarter inch video player. And uh, 
He broke it into a couple of parts and made a great introductory. And this was the first docudrama that Bill Leverton ever did. And from then on, he done a whole bunch of doctor dramas. And uh, so uh, we got Fort Huachuca. Uh, the regular United States Army from Fort Huachuca, their cavalry to come up, and we reenacted this whole thing for Bill. And um, we've done it, I've done it uh, 14 years in a row at Picacho Peak State Park. The first year we were there, I sent out uh, professional media releases to all the newspapers and TV shows. We had 5,000 people show up sitting on the edge of the hill watching our reenactment and five television stations, three from, t from Phoenix and two from Tucson that came up. There was Arizona Highways done a story on it that's in there, uh, several magazines uh, and, and what have you. It, it's just been a great success and uh, we run it all those years uh, without getting a penny. Uh, the Battle of Picacho Bass was strictly a cavalry affair. Uh, in later years, the infantry got involved and the artillery got involved and they were doing battles from all over the southwest at Picacho Pass. And today, at the monument where the stone pillar is, there's a very nice replica of a cannon. But folks, no cannons were used in this battle. I'd like to close this story by just reading a poem that I put in this little booklet that I wrote 40 years ago. And this little booklet has uh, both battle reports of the commanders in the field that, that complement each other perfectly and tell the whole story. And this little poem tells a little bit of the story too. In the Arizona desert in 1862, rode the cavalry in Confederate gray and the boys in Union blue. Man and horse across the burning sand for supremacy of the West, neither side was to know where would be the test. After many long and weary days, they finally met at last to fight a desperate battle known as Picacho Pass. Onward into battle, hooves and hearts together pound. Mid swirling dust and powder smoke, men and mounts went down. Death the pale horse also rode to do his work so grim. He, he rode beside each of those whose eyes were soon to dim. And when the fighting ended, each went his separate way, the cavalry in the Union Blue and the boys in Confederate Gray. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.